Hey everyone, good morning once again, and thank you for joining in. Uh, good to see you. I hope you all are doing well. Um, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we submit these uh, sessions into your hands, the first and the second. Uh, Lord, even as we get back to uh, learning from your word, Holy Spirit, I pray that uh, we will encounter you like never before. I pray that the scriptures will spring to life as we learn from it, Lord. Uh, thank you for every individual. Um, thank you for what you're doing in them and through them. Lord, I give you all the glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Uh, once again, good to see you all. Um, good morning, Lubega. Uh, thank you for confirming that the audio is okay. Uh, hi, Zalatoli. Hi, Roslyn. Hello, Anita. Hi, Leah. Hi, Jafina. Steve. Um, yeah, this is to do a quick recap of where we left off last week and we'll continue. Uh, so, uh, last in the last session, we extensively looked at the worship uh, in the Old Testament, how it was organized in, uh, in the tabernacle of, uh, briefly in the tabernacle of uh, the Temple of Solomon, that is, uh, and, uh, you know, how the singing and the sacrifices uh, was done in one accord. It was a session of celebration. It was a meeting meeting place uh, of for joy, and it was filled with joy and celebration and music and dancing and shouting of love, uh, uh, love noise, making love noise. Um, and so we see that David kind of set the order because we read that later, even during the time of Nehemiah and Ezra, that it says that they followed the order of David, that they that what he said. Uh, and so uh, there was the worship we can see uh, very briefly in the Old Testament or during the time of the second tem uh, first temple was it was administered well, it was organized well, uh, worship ministry uh, in general, right? That's what I'm talking about. And then we looked at what the Psalms, we can't talk about Old Testament and worship and not talk about Psalms. Uh, right, because um, yes, in the context of worship, psalms are a big deal. And so we saw what the psalms have to teach us about worship. Uh, we addressed with the five philosophical questions, when, where, why, what, uh, and how. Uh, we looked into that, and um, and I requested you all to go through the next segment, um, is worship in the New Testament. Uh, very briefly, I'll just go through it because... Um, I'm, I believe you all would have done that. But uh, again, just to give a gist, you know, the, in, in the New Testament, uh, you know, there were synagogues and, and the home cell group kind of meetings, okay, um, or life groups as we call it, or cell groups, uh, was prominent, was big, uh, because that, that was in it, it was in its final form, which had started during their time uh, of exile in, in Babylon because they did not have a common place to meet a meeting place a place a corporate a place of corporate worship a place for corporate worship uh because they were in babylon uh right in a in a in a gentile nation as they would call it or in a pagan nation as they would call it uh they would meet in small groups in different houses and when they got back they continued do, doing that 70 years later they continued meeting uh, in cell groups and so what we later see in the new testament is in its final form are the synagogues uh, and also small groups so they continue to meet in in fellowship uh in houses and whatnot and and singing would take place and we have multiple scriptures uh you know that is mentioned in the notes from the romans 15 first corinthians 14 um uh, and uh, one of the couple of scriptures that I want to highlight from the previous section, um, that's worship in the New Testament in your PDFs would be page 15, is Colossians 3.16 and Hebrews 2.12. Colossians 3.16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts, uh, to the Lord. So singing was encouraged, uh, and we can actually decipher or break that verse, Colossians 3.16, and, and actually it's done. Uh, but, uh, you know, it starts off by saying, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Right? Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.17 uh, and 18, uh, it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
uh, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Um, and so let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Dwell. Uh, we're going to be looking at that word uh, more deeply today. Uh, so let the word of Christ dwell in you. It's simply that dwell is dwelling place, right? It's another word for uh, let it tabernacle in you. Uh, that's the word okay so uh, when we read in john chapter 1 verse 14 it says the word became flesh and he dwelt among us means he tabernacled among us and so when this colossians 3 16 says let the word of christ be tabernacled let, let it let it not leave let it be pitched in your heart and as a result of that uh you know you would sing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and and you see the other side of that coin in Ephesians 5.18 goes on to say that don't be drunk in wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, I think most of the Christians, we are very good at following the first part of that commandment. That means, which is don't be drunk with wine. It's like, oh, yes, yes, pastor, brother, sister, I am a Christian. I, I don't drink. Uh, but what about the second part of that commandment? He goes on to say, we completely ignore that. We 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 we, ha we do not give enough importance. He goes on to say, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, as a result of that, Paul goes on to say, sing to one another in Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And so the Word of God uh, was and the Holy Spirit was given great importance, which resulted in worship in the New Testament. And that's how, um, and that is the importance that was given in the New Testament. Uh, as we see, along with corporate worship and uh, whatnot. Okay, right. Uh, I hope you all are okay uh, so far. Um, so what we'll do today, we'll start off with uh, the tabernacle of Moses. Okay, the tabernacle of Moses. We are in page 16. Uh, am I right? I hope, yeah, in your PDFs. Hope the page number is correct. So we're all following along. Okay. All right. Um, uh, all of you have your PDFs with you, right? Um, just uh, give me a quick thumbs up if you do some sort. If you're, are you on the same page, everyone? Uh, okay. Okay, great, awesome. Thank you for confirming that. Right. Um, so the tabernacle of Moses uh, is a, it's uh, we know that it was uh, an image or a shadow or a pattern that already existed in the heavens that was shown to Moses. Okay. Uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter eight. Hebrews chapter eight. Your Bibles, if you will. So it goes on to say, uh, Hebrews 8, verse 1 onwards, um, it says, Now the point in what we are saying is this, we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand uh, of the throne of majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. Okay, uh, for every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this high, for this priest also to have something to offer. Verse five. They serve a copy and shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, "See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain." So Moses received the blueprint, so to say, from God 
and he goes on to say in the verse 5 make sure you build according to the pattern that was shown to you okay so uh, uh, so the tabernacle of moses uh, was a shadow of the heavenly things which already existed in the heavens okay uh, which all, and that was what was shown to moses but here's the thing uh, why is the tabernacle of Moses important in the Old Testament and why is it important for us as Christians or as Bible college students to understand uh, or even learn uh, why is is because uh, if we have to study about the tabernacle uh, we the first time God instructs is in Exodus 25 okay but let's not start there let's go to genesis chapter 3 okay if um turn with me if you will to genesis chapter 3 it's the famous chapter chapter of the fall The chapter that we will all hold when we get to heaven and ask Adam, what's up with this? Why did this happen? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, so Genesis chapter 3. Um, so you see that God has created uh, everything now and this they are in the Garden of Eden. Um, Eden, the Garden of Eden, was a divine place. It was a meeting place, um, so to say, where heaven and earth would meet. Okay? Uh, which is why no one is able to locate where Garden of Eden is if it was an earthly thing. Okay? It was a meeting place, a common place, where the, where the divine would meet with the humanity. Divinity would meet with the humanity. Okay? It, that's where they walked, they fellowshiped together. They walked in the cool of the garden. They had that communion uh, with the Lord. The creation, man had communion with the Lord. But then, in, in chapter 3, verse 8, we see that, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden okay um, so this is where we actually have to begin the tabernacle uh, is when sin entered they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord that means they separated themselves from the presence um, of the Lord so the simple definition of what sin is it's being separated from god that's what it is right it is when god comes and asks adam where art thou god already knows the answer he doesn't need to know where he is and or hear from adam to know where he is it's almost uh, some of the scholars uh, in a way they interpret it is it's all it's it's, it's a cry as in when God comes back to the meeting place, he's saying, Adam, I can't find your spirit here. It's something like that. And so that's why when you read in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, we were dead in sin. What happens when we die physically? Our spirit, our soul leaves our body and this physical body just falls dead. Right? It has nothing. It's been separated, isn't it? Um, so the soul, spirit and soul has been separated from your physical uh, body. And so you just, you die physically. Right? And it's the same thing spiritually. Is sin, because of sin, we were separated. Our spirit was separated from the spirit of God. And everything since is to make that reconciliation happen. Now, why do we have to start the tabernacle from here is from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Exodus 25. 
okay genesis chapter 3 all the way till exodus 25 exodus chapter 25 you can think about all the great stories that has happened the timeline is approximately 2500 years is what is what is claimed the you know approximately so the timeline between between genesis chapter 3 from the time of the fall till exodus 25 is approximately 2500 years now why is this important for us to know is because for 2500 years there was no dwelling place for god on earth now in between all that those years uh, we see that there was visitations of God. God visited. He visited Abraham, right? He would speak to Noah. And you can think of all the great stories that has happened. He, he showed himself to uh, Hagar. There were so many Christophanies and Theophanies. Right? In Joshua chapter 5, he comes as the Lord of the captain of the Lord of hosts, right? So there were visitations of the Lord. His hand was on him, right? But there was no dwelling place for God on earth. There was no meeting place you know, continuously where divinity and humanity would be in communion. And it seemed like man was okay with that. Nobody felt the need to ask, uh, okay, will you come, won't you come and live with us? But God takes that initiative. Okay, it's been 2,500 years without me not having dwelt with my people. And so, he gives the blueprint to Moses. Here it is. Uh, so the tabernacle of Moses was mending, you know, like a mending a tear, which was separated, which was torn. We were separated from the Spirit of God. We were, we were lost hopelessly as orphans. Uh, we were left to die. But then God makes takes this initiative to give this plan. Okay, you know what? Uh, we, we, you, I'm going to instruct you and you are going to build a meeting place and there in the midst of the cherubims I will meet with you he says for the first time there is a dwelling place a resting place in other words for God here on earth right uh, and so the cause of all that was being separated from the presence of God is was sin uh, are you with me so far? Yeah. Uh, so he chooses, he, he, and for him to, again, after the fall, like I said, there are so many great stories, isn't it, from Genesis chapter 3. And, and the first 11 chapters of the Bible, it seems like a major failure, right, of every other, every project, like, you know. But then God doesn't give up. He starts, he picks a man called Abraham, right, and he starts a new line of race through Abraham. He just starts a new race of people. I mean, only God can do that. Right? Uh, and you, Abraham was already 70, 75 years old. He was not even a baby. He just said, okay, you know, but even just starting a new race, how do you start a new race? <laughs> a race of people. Uh, you know, only God can do that. And, uh, and, and and he tells and he gives all this promise to uh, a Abraham. Actually, let's go to Genesis 15. I, uh, are you all with me, guys? Um, or, or are you all like bored? Okay. All right. Uh, Genesis chapter 15. Let's go to 13, verse 13 onwards, 13, 14, and 15, I'll read. Um, 13 and 14, I think, is enough. Okay. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, it says, Then he said to Abram, he is God, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a strange land that is not their own, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Okay, so what, who's, what, who's God talking about? 
Egyptians, isn't it? So God is prophesying to Abraham about what what his descendants are going to uh, go through four hundred years ahead. Four hundred years ahead. I mean, that's it's not surprising because it's God. Uh, he's outside of time, right? Uh, he's in the past, present, and the future all at once. And so he's telling Abraham, four hundred years from now, your descendants. They will be strangers in a strange land. They will be uh, persecuted. Uh, they will, you know, they will uh, be punished. But uh, the nation that they serve, I will judge. God says, and they, and when they come out of that nation, they will come out with great possessions. That means they will come out with a lot of wealth. A New King James versions or King James version says, with great substance. Okay, are you with me? Now, so this is God telling Abraham about his descendants and about Egypt. Now, just, just go back a, a, a little bit, rewind a little bit, go to Genesis chapter 13. Okay, Genesis chapter 13. Uh, so there is a time when Abraham goes to Egypt. You remember that? This is where it is, okay? So uh, between in Genesis 12, verse 10 to 20, Genesis chapter 12, 10 to 20, talks about Abraham's time in Egypt. Okay, but here's this, check this out. Genesis chapter 13, verse 1 onwards, it says, Then Abram went up from Egypt, he's coming up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him to the south. Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. So again, Abraham was in Egypt. Uh, we don't really know how many years. Uh, I should say, I don't really know how many years. Uh, but when he came out of Egypt, he came out with great possession. He came out a wealthy man. Okay? Uh, and so again, there's a pattern, there's a shadow through his, his life. You know, this, God speaks through, you know, like this. He has great fun in communicating like this, giving us, you know, what we call it as Easter eggs here and there, the clues uh, and whatnot, right? Um, so he leaves all these things. And then from, you know, from 12, he starts a new race of people. And then uh, Jacob and his sons, uh, Joseph, we all know, again, uh, is the minister. He's made the prime minister of Egypt. And then there came a pharaoh uh, who did not know Joseph or what he had done. And so God uses this 400 years, uh, they can, you know, of this, I think approximately 70 odd people went into the uh, country of Egypt as a family. And in 400 years, they come out as a nation. Right? They go in as a family, but they come out a nation of, pe uh, of people. All right? Uh, and so... Uh, and it is this people through whom and God chooses Moses. Uh, uh, you know, we all know the story. And then after all of this great story is when we actually arrive at Exodus 45, uh, 25. Exodus chapter 25. Uh, Exodus 25 verse 8. Uh, verse 8, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, by this chapter, by Exodus 25, uh, a lot of things have happened again, right? Uh, from Exodus 19, uh, you know, actually, let's go to Exodus 19. I just don't want to give you the reference. So Exodus, Exodus chapter 19. And verse 3 onwards, it says, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Verse 5. And now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Let's pause there, okay? God's heart 
originally was for the entire nation of Israel to be a nation of priests, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. So between 19 and chapter 19 and verse 25, uh, and chapter 25, uh, people, children of Israel say, uh, they look at this whole mountain which is on fire and the leaders of the Israel say they are scared. It's like, uh, and they tell Moses, uh, Moses, we don't want to talk with this God. You speak with him and you tell us what to do. We will do everything. They were lying, but, <laughs> but you can understand their, uh, why they're afraid, you know, to a certain degree, because again, we have to remember that these people were in Egypt for 400 odd years, isn't it? And for 400, 400 years is equivalent to 10 generations. Right? That's 10 generations. You can lose a lot of church in 10 generations. Right? For generation after generation after generation, they've only seen and been exposed to the gods of Egypt. Right? The idols that they have made. Uh, you know, because the, the, that's the only thing they can see. They have never, never encountered or seen anything like this God. Where, and they see the whole mountain is on fire. The, like the whole earth is shaking and trembling. And they had no idea what the, who they were going to meet and encounter in the desert. But they were there. Uh, and God's heart was them from the beginning was, I have brought you to myself. That means he's saying, I did not bring you out for the sake of bringing you up. That means I'm not giving you freedom for the sake of giving you freedom so you can do whatever you want to do. I am setting you apart. That means I'm bringing you to myself. And if you obey me and keep my commandments, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, but that's... And then God goes on to give the Ten Commandments. We all know what happens. People of Israel sin. They build a golden calf. The great possession and substance they came out with, the, all the wealth and gold and everything, they use it to build a golden calf. And uh, God is angry. His wrath uh, is poured out as judgment. And Moses says, those who are on the Lord's side shall come to me. And it says in the Bible, now only the Levites went running towards him. The people of the tribe of Levites went running. Everything I'm saying is in the Bible, by the way. So you just read it. Okay. And so it, it, the tribe of Levites being the priest, priestly tribe begins from there. That's the origin. Okay. And then again, within the nation, within the 12 tribes, God chooses one tribe uh, to be the priests that are set apart for him. And it is through those priestly uh, lineage from Moses and Aaron and Miriam, uh, you know, the, the functionality and the commandments and the duties of the tabernacle is given. Okay. Now, everything what we've spoken so far is just like the origin story <laughs> of the tabernacle. Okay. Uh, so we just kind of scratch the surface of uh, what the tabernacle uh, is real is, is is all about. Okay, um, so please tell me you're all alive. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Awesome. Uh, any questions or thoughts you want to ask or share now? before we continue. Okay. <clears throat> All right then, okay. Um, let me just show you an imagination uh, picture, uh, an imagined picture of the tabernacle, how it could have looked like. Could have, would have, should have. Right? Um, it's just a nice rendition, a good imagination. Uh, of the mm -hmm. tabernacle. Um, 
by the way, all these images are available on Google Images. <laughs> uh, so you see, all it's from every side, from, from the outside, it was surrounded with this white cloth linen, right? All four sides. And uh, what we call as the outer coats is this. Can you see my arrow moving? There's a brazen altar or bronze altar or also known as the altar of sacrifice. Um, here, just before the tent, you see it's a bronze laver or brazen laver where it was filled with water. And on the inside, it was it was made of the mirrors. Um, we'll get to that in just a bit. And then from here on is the inner courts. And um, you see the divine light, the cloud, the glory of God. OK, so there were the tabernacle had four sides. That's not south, east, west. But if you had to enter, there was only one gate. There was only one way to enter. Are you with me? OK. Um, and all the tents of people pitched all sides. Yeah, can I stop sharing this image? <clears throat> okay, let's show another mm -hmm. image. Let me share another one. Now, God gives a lot of commands, uh, commandment to people <coughs> on uh, Excuse me, guys. Sorry, my. Now, uh, every you know, you'll read all about this in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy, as God is very specific about which tribe should be which side of the tabernacle and all of that. And so, if the tabernacle was in the middle, and uh, it has four sides: the east, the south, the north, and the west, and ac according to their population, so each side, you know, it had, and so each side would have three tribes. And all the four side, each three, uh, the tri three tribes will have one flag. And so that's why you see the camp of Judah, which was like the each camp, uh, each uh, uh, camp uh, had a leading uh, tribe, so to speak. OK, so the camp of Judah, Ishakar, and Zebulun, the leading tribe, the leader kind of tribe was Judah. And their flag was the flag of a lion. Okay, and the camp of Reuben, where Ru the tribe of Reuben, Simeon, and Gad was, had a flag with the symbol of a man. And the camp of Ephraim with the symbol of an ox. And then the camp of Dan had the symbol of an eagle. Now you tell me where you've read these. Ezekiel. Yeah, okay. Ezekiel revelation. Uh, it's uh, and so this is a bird's eye imagination, a portrayal of how it would have looked from a bird's eye view, uh, right? It will, uh, it's, a, it's a shadow. New Testament talks about that how the tabernacle of Moses was a shadow of Jesus Christ. It was a shadow. Okay, so um, yeah, and let me see, and to give us a, just a little bit better understanding, or just one more image, guys. Sorry. So on the, this is a different rendition of the tabernacle of Moses, a different mm -hmm. idea. So again, you see the entrance gate is at the east. Now, if you remember in the last class, we read that uh, a tribe of uh, singers stood by the altar on, this, on the east. And I asked, why are they standing at the east, isn't it? So now you kind of get the <laughs> uh, so the gate is over here on the east side. And you enter as the outer court where you have the altar of burnt offerings, burnt bronze laver, and the inner courts. You have three furnitures, which is altar of incense, table of showbread or shoebread, or it was also known as the table of the presence or a table of the face, uh, golden lampstand. And, and then it was separated 
by a thick curtain between the holy place and the most holy place or also known as the holy of holies okay the holy of holies um, Yeah, so uh, before we uh, resume, uh, once again, I just want to give some time for any questions or thoughts. Does anybody have anything? Because now that we've established um, like an origin story for the tabernacle, uh, before we actually begin start learning about it, uh, I just want to take time to see if anybody has something to say. All right, um, so what I'd like to do now is actually pause here before we resume. Um, I, uh, I'm giving you a little bit of an extended break because uh, my throat isn't uh, feeling great. Um, so we'll pause here, we'll come back and we'll resume from where we left off, okay? All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> 